On today's show, the LA Clippers starting five for opening night and the life without Kawhi to begin the season has been announced. Going to be joined by Clipper radio host and host of Clippers Talk, Adam Oslan, to discuss it all on today's Locked On Preseason Clippers. You are Locked On Clippers, your daily Los Angeles Clippers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, sir. You are locking in with the clips. Thank you for making Locked On Clippers the first listen of your day, your team every day. I'm your host, Darian Viziri, born and raised in LA and going into my 20th season as a Clipper fan next week. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dime Dropper Pod and check out my video on my first night at the Intuit Dome, interviewing so many fans on Dime Dropper YouTube channel and, of course, Locked On Clippers, free and available wherever you get your podcasts including YouTube. Let me know what you think of this episode and the starting five that we are going to talk about. And we means me and our Clipper radio host, who I'm happy to have for a third time back and has been challenging me in the workload and Clipper content this off season with the <laughs> crazy lineup of guests. He's continued to have Adam Oslund. Welcome back to the show, my friend. I see you, Darian. I'm just trying to step up and just try to, uh, yeah, have that workmanlike mentality here that you do on Locked On. Yes, sir. And this episode of Locked On Clippers is brought to you by Game Time. Get the best deals on last minute tickets with Game Time. Just download the app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. In this episode, Adam and I are going to be talking about our reactions to the starting five, and of course, this is the starting five without Kawhi Leonard, who will not play opening nine from everything that we've been told. Has that been confirmed yet, Adam? It's not confirmed, but everybody's reading the tea leaves that way at this point, just because he'd have to practice. He'd have to do some contact live five on five practices. You would assume he's not playing obviously in the last preseason game. So therefore how long would it take for him to go through all those steps before opening night to be available next Wednesday? It just seems unlikely. Right. So we're going to talk about that. And then, of course, our reaction to the Intuit Dome first night. You heard mine, but we're going to ask Adams and also talk about Bones Highland, who didn't play at all in that preseason game. But let's get into the most important news. The starting five has been confirmed likely for opening night against the Phoenix Suns and for the foreseeable future. James Harden, Derek Jones Jr., Terrence Mann, Norman Powell, and Ivica Zubats. Initial impressions on that. I think that's where we all knew it was going because we're going to need some scoring punch with Kawhi out, and then we get that with Norman Powell, and then, of course, Terrence and Derek Jones Jr. Yeah, some people, I think, wanted to lean into defense even more so and maybe have Amir Coffey or Nico Batum in there. Therefore, Derek Jones Jr. is not playing the four. But this was what I expected all along. You just can't go in as much as you can say with Norman Powell in the backcourt at times with James Harden, even though he could be playing the three or playing against and guarding threes that aren't scores. I think that's one of the ways they'll try to hide Norman Powell. Even with him in the backcourt with James Harden, given that Norm is putting a little bit more emphasis on defense, and we have seen it so far in the preseason, the first game in Honolulu against the Golden State Warriors, he blocked pods and swatted it out of bounds. and was like, oh, this is different. This is different from Norm. Okay, maybe some of that Toronto Raptors defense, the UCLA Bruins defense he used to play. That's what we want to see. So if his defense is average or slightly above average, that mitigates a lot of the issues going on when you talk about having a smaller backcourt and him playing next to James Harden because that's the deficiency you're looking at in the starting lineup. You still have three good defenders out there, but if you had somebody else in place of Norman Powell, could you really be elite to start basketball games on the defensive end? Maybe Chris Dunn could be out there. I didn't mention him. But offensively, as you mentioned, they need the scoring juice. They have to have that because – Teams are going to load up and just try to say, look, if we slow down James Harden, we slow down the Clippers, period. We take him out of it. We take the Clippers out of it. I think the Clippers are preparing for this by having James play more off the ball and by having a guy like Norm also being able to bring it up in the starting lineup along with Terrence Mann. Even Derek Jones Jr. the other night brought it up a couple times. So I think they are prepared for what teams are going to throw at them with this starting five. And I like it because of the balance. It's not ideal still. It's not perfect. You need Kawhi Leonard back to do any real damage in the West. But can you survive with this starting five? I think so. I hope so. Yeah. 
I'm a defense first guy, as you know, but there is a level of you still need to put the ball in the basket. And if you did go with Amir or Nico in that starting lineup, I mean, it's it would be rough offensively, especially in this West. You're going to need more talent out there. You mentioned the off-ball component. There's been a lot of, you know, dribble handoffs at the top of the key and some plays with James Harden coming off the wing and curling into pick and rolls. And that's something that I wonder if it's an emphasis from the coaching staff to have a little bit more movement at the top like that. And with Norm, you're allowed to have that sort of movement. And he's really great in that curl going to his right that he ran with Zoo and always ends up either finishing or dropping it off into the basket to Zoo. So giving Norm, getting Norm out there helps us have a little bit of an off-ball component because other than that, as you mentioned, if we don't have Norm, it seems like it's just going to be James Harden high pick and roll or James Harden isolation at the top, everybody watching, and no one else is really much of a threat to do much offensively on the move or uh, with the ball in their hands. It has to be James Harden creating for them. As far as scoring in that starting five, one thing that we've harped on is if it's a Zubats and his involvement. What do you think so far of – the preseason in the sense of how much we've involved zoo relative to the past, because I thought last game we did a slightly better job, but other games, maybe not as much as you and I would like. Yeah, I agree with you. Of course, we're big of Zubots Zubats fans here. I think he's the third most important player, impactful player on the Clippers team coming into the season. I think it's been honestly shaky so far in the preseason because some games they're not featuring him as much. And I think the game against Brooklyn and San Diego that was the intent because they thought it would be too easy going up against a bunch of six, eight guys and Brooklyn had nobody out there to just play through a Vita Zubots. But would you really learn anything? But then the last couple of games, Coach Lou talked about it after they were in Seattle, taking on the Portland Trailblazers, not getting it to him in his sweet spots, making him have to dribble to get to his spots, to get deeper into the post. So that was a problem with the offense, not featuring him as much and also not getting it to him where he needs the basketball. But then you see the game against Dallas in the end to it dome home opener preseason granted but still the home opener and he got the ball with with the right spacing at times and coach Lou criticized him afterwards a little bit for saying he was forcing things or moving too quickly or just not playing at his tempo or his speed and rushing things a little bit be quick but don't hurry as John Wooden would say there's a distinction there there's a difference so whether it's the team not featuring him enough or visa Zubas not really getting into his bag and being as comfortable as you would like, I think it's been up and down so far with his play and with the Clippers trying to feature him and focus and make him more of a focal point on the offensive end so far in the preseason. And he struggled in that first quarter and in the first half, the starters struggled in that game against the Dallas Mavericks without Luka, without Kyrie Irving. That was a little bit concerning, much better in that third quarter. They went plus 10 the first six minutes of the third, dominated like they should against a Dallas team missing their two stars and ball handlers out there. But Avisa Zubac, you saw he got dumped on by Derek Lively right away in the first quarter. And then he comes out, and you see the difference. And I'm not saying, and I'm not trying to throw red meat out there for the Kai Jones stands, like he should be starting over Zoo. But there was a lob immediately again. This time it was to Gafford, and Kai just swatted it and broke it up. And then went the other way for a dunk as he beat his man Gafford down the floor. So Avisa Zubac just has to, I think, be a little bit more decisive out there also. It's the team's, it's all, it's, the onus is on the team to get him involved, first of all. But then he has to do his part there and make sure that they have confidence in him the rest of the way because they're going to need him all season long. He has to be at that 16 and 10, 15 and 10 level, I think, average-wise this year. Yeah, I agree. And, and I would say he's, without Kawhi, the second most important player uh, on the team, the post position thing, that's something I haven't been too critical about with zoo in the past years, but I have noticed in the preseason, he did. There was one game in particular. I think it was the Nets one where he was getting pushed out a little further than they'd like him to catch it, which, so I totally get that point. So that'll be something to watch is zoo continuing to fight for that deep post position. Cause once he catches it on that left block, usually good things will happen. I also have a little bit of a fear that, if he misses a jump hook, they just won't go to him for like a whole quarter after that. And I think, you know, we got to treat Zoo like everyone else. Everybody else gets a chance to miss their shots and get it again. We should allow Zoo to have the same leeway. Um, my last question on this topic is, with that being the starting five, we go to the bench. Definitely going to be really reliant on Kevin Porter Jr. Is that bench, especially when James Harden sits, good enough to keep us in play-in territory? 
I think so if they have that defensive mindset. And they have shown that. They gave them that surge, that boost late in the first quarter and into the second quarter against Dallas. It was the bench that got them the lead at the half, really. They played much better. They played with energy, but they also were flying around defensively. Early in that fourth quarter the other night, the Dallas Mavericks got completely wrecked by the Clippers, who looked like Wingstop. They looked like Clamp City. It's preseason against D Dallas that doesn't have Luka, doesn't have Kyrie Irving. But it's a mindset. It's a mentality. It is a level of pride that they're taking on the defensive end. And I think it's from Jeff Van Gundy. There's something, I talked about this the other night, Darian, but there's something to having an OG like that on your squad that gets everybody's attention. He's been there, done that. He has the respect, but I think it's fun playing for a guy like that too. I think he's reinvigorated being back in the NBA. I think it's also juiced up the team a little bit with just saying, Hey, we know where we have to hang our hat. We have a defensive coordinator now that has done this at an elite level. You brought it up before, but I think his defenses have never been worse than sixth when he was a head coach in the NBA, Jeff Van Gundy. So, I don't know if the Clippers can be that this season, depending on how many games Kawhi Leonard plays, but I know they're going to be in contention for that. And I know they're going to be, I think they need to be a top eight defense to have a chance to get out of the plan. And in the 21-22 season, they were eighth in the league. So I think if that backup group commits to playing defense, and even Kevin Porter Jr. has looked pretty decent on that end, and he was a part of that group that made that big run early in the fourth quarter where Dallas didn't get a bucket. They had some free throws, but they didn't make a field goal until I think the 7.30 mark of the fourth and had about five turnovers, really, in the first five minutes of that fourth quarter. They had 29 in the game, so I guess you'd expect some of that to happen. But it was the Clippers just with the intent of, we're not giving up any easy buckets even though we're up by 15 in this game already. This is who we are. This is how we have to play. Chris Dunn also, just kind of him coming off the bench to me, reinforces that, hey, we're a defensive mindset team. This is what we do now. This is the only way I know how to play. Patrick Beverly was starting with the Clippers back in the day. They have a guy in, in a Pat Bev-like mode coming off the bench now with Chris Dunn, who, by the way, I guess is being called Smoke, or that's one of his nicknames, which is awesome for a guy who yeah. plays a little chippy and has gotten in some fights and uh, some scuffles here and there. Like Between him, between Nick Batum coming off the bench, and obviously Norman Powell's going to be staggered, it sounds like. He'll be with the bench unit. Avita Zubats will play a lot with the bench unit. There's another good defender there. They should always have three pretty darn good defenders on the floor at all times, bench or starters. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, more to say about the defense, but also got to talk about the Intuit Dome and our reactions to it coming up. What a night it was. I got to tell you a little something about FanDuel. Hey, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So when you, get, when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Been looking at these NBA odds, Adam, on FanDuel, and they've got the Clippers right now as the lowest for the division winner odds. How are you feeling about that? Right now, it's uh, plus 1,200. I'd have them over the Golden State Warriors at least, so that might be good value. Yeah, I, I was saying the same exact thing. Golden State Warriors fans, so I'm getting super excited because of a preseason win against the Lakers yesterday. So FanDuel is where, where you need to go to get any of these bets on the Clippers or any other sport. FanDuel.com is the place to be. All right, Adam, let's talk about that special night, the Intuit Dome, your first night covering the Clippers in an NBA basketball game in any capacity. Of course, as we mentioned, preseason as the radio host, new media spot, new arena. Talk to me about it. So we're a little bit higher up. There's more of a bird's eye view. But as you know, when you're at Intuit Dome, there's not a bad seat in the house. So even though you would think, judging by the seat level, you're closer to the upper deck, you're too far away from the court. But no, it's just not like that there. And that's the most important thing. You're closer 
to the action. What I couldn't believe was, first of all, you walk in, and I hadn't seen the Halo board, and I guess it still wasn't at full capacity yet with all the things they can do. Even James Harden spoke about that post game. They're holding back for opening night with all the features on the Halo 360 board. But it still just looks like augmented reality to me. It doesn't look real. It feels like I have the Oculus Rift on or whatever, the Quest. It feels like virtual reality, the Halo Adam, board. Adam, I, at sometimes, I mean, I was seeing a little pretty high, honestly. And as you said, no bad seat in the house. But I found myself looking at the screen when the ball was actually in play at times. Like, this is so clear. And I'm not to even hate on the Stable Center because people know I love that arena. It's like home for me. But that screen is nowhere near comparable and i haven't seen the new one but in terms of the high definition i mean ai aside it was like i couldn't take my eyes off it not a coincidence they had to upgrade as soon as they heard about the halo board there but it's still right. not going to be able to touch the technology that the clippers have it's almost like a sensory overload going on it's overwhelming when you walk in there it's still going to take time to get comfortable in this new arena i think for everybody that's just the way it is but we're fine with that because it's got that fresh new arena smell all the seats are much more comfortable than they used to be um it's clean it's pristine and the wall to me, the effect, I wondered about if they could really get what they were looking for from having the 51 rows straight up pretty much. It's at an angle, but it is steep. You were there. And to get that college-like atmosphere. Well, I compare it to like a home theater system or like when you're at the theaters and everything's separated by channels with the sound. And so someone walks to the right, you can tell they're on the right side, the left side. The wall sound is so distinct in the arena. It was to my right, and I could tell it was to my right the entire game. Like, it just separates itself from all the other sound. It is that loud. I joked, but it's so effective against the opposition that even when the Clippers were shooting free throws there in the second half and they're chanting out Jordan Miller after he was fouled on a three-pointer, he missed two free throws. Like, that's how effective the wall is and just how close people are and how loud it is and how on top of the opposition you're going to be because their bench is right there. Like they can pick and choose the opposition every night, which basket they want to start on, I guess. So they can choose, and I think Dallas did, to not have to play on that basket in the second half. But you can't choose where the bench is. And I heard from somebody in the comment section the other night that they saw Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving talking to each other and apparently like signaling to each other like we're going to need some earplugs. <laughs> <laughs> being near the wall on the opposition's bench at Into It Dome. So I'm super happy that that part of it was successful and it was still not full at all. So it is going to be, it's the best place in the world to watch a basketball game, Darian. That's the best way I can put it. Yeah, I can't even imagine what the Olympics are going to be like. Obviously, never better than a Clipper game, but the Olympics, Olympic basketball in 2028, it's just going to be amazing. And it's just, it's such an honor as a Clipper fan, that we are going to be hosting that. The whole world is going to be watching the Olympic gold medal basketball game at the Intuit Dome at the Clippers Arena. But to piggyback off what you said about the wall, so like last year I was in, as everybody knows, the supporters section, which was the baby wall, which is that heart of the wall that you're talking about. Like I was technically sitting in the wall, but I'll just let you know, there was a lot of, you know, obviously a lot of empty seats around me because I was a little higher, but Right now, what the wall looks like on TV is the supporter section. That standing section right behind the basket that I was a part of in 207. In 207, it just – we were in the background. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. behind even the 100 section, we weren't able to really banter with players on the opposing team or anything like that. And you couldn't even see us half the time when we were they were doing the distractions on free throws because we tried to do them, but they wouldn't even show up on TV or we wouldn't show up on TV. So – this really just feels like what that supporter section was made for. And I, you could see with some of the interviews I did in the, in the dime dropper video from the supporter section, we are literally like on top of the corner three. Like it's, it's insane. I've never been in an arena that feels that way. It's so drastic from Staples center. And it's crazy to me because they're both NBA arenas, but it's just the way it's built. Staples center is just out. Whereas into a dome is on top and, Man, I mean, it's going to be great. I just, long term, if you're a Clipper fan that likes to be loud at these games, yeah, you have to stand up when the ball's in play, but that supporter section is going to be the place to be. That's interesting you bring up the corner three. If they can affect that, that is a huge advantage because we were looking at the numbers yesterday, myself and Justin Russo, and teams average shooting 39% on corner threes last year. 
I'm going to track what oppositions do against the Clippers on those corner threes and whatever half they're shooting there. And it, like has that's, to be, it has to be that left corner three by the by the bench. That's the one where you feel like you're really on top of them. But, uh, yeah, I don't think it'll affect the, the players shooting that because they're not still looking at the crowd. I just – in the sense of just how close we are, it was, it was insane. But coming up, we're going to be talking about the man that seems to be kind of the odd man out right now. With KPJ getting so many reps in preseason, I've had fans ask me, what happened to Bones Highland? What's going to happen to him? He was a DNP the other night. We're going to be talking about that coming up. I got to tell you a little something about Game Time. Game Time is the best place to get great deals last minute on tickets. Still contemplating if I want to use it for the Phoenix Suns home opener on Wednesday, a week from today. We'll see. Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets to see your favorite teams play live even easier. And Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. As I said a couple episodes ago, I finally used Game Time and I used it for the Dodger game and it was really solid. This I think it was a day before I used it. So Game Time, it, it's it's legit. But don't forget this like I did. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time Picks. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off your first purchase. I'm still mad at myself. I didn't use the code. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-NBA for $20 off. Be smart. Not like the host of this show. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game time. Game time. All right, Adam. So the last bit of business we wanted to cover today, before we actually flip it over to Clippers Talk, that's going to be part of our, our double header as we did last time. Oh, Bones, I got some stuff for you there. There we go. Bones <laughs> Highland, you know, a fan favorite, even though he hasn't really, besides the second half of the season when he was traded here, hasn't really gotten a chance to play in front of Clipper fans consistently. This season, after losing Russell Westbrook this offseason, it felt like it's going to come now. But then we had KPJ in the mix, who's proven more at the NBA level, having averaged 20 points for the Houston Rockets. I know they weren't a good team, but that's more than Bones has done. In the preseason, seems like he's been favored a lot more. Bones got a DNP in the first game of the Intuit Dome. What are your thoughts on this? And does it mean anything bigger? I mean, it's no secret that they tried to move Bones and PJ at the deadline last season. They weren't able to. Those guys weren't happy about it. There was some insubordination or whatever going on, conduct detrimental to the team, I think is what they call it. And they were sent home right before the All-Star break after they weren't moved to the trade deadline. Then Lawrence Frank talked about it after the press conference or during the press conference, talking about Kawhi being sent home from Team USA. And it sounded like they were still exploring trade options and trying to find he and PJ a better opportunity to play more. Because once they brought in not just KPJ, but also Chris Dunn, to me, it's like, yeah, one guy was out in Russell Westbrook. They brought, brought two more guys in that he's going to be competing for minutes against. So I think the writing is on the wall for Bones that if they can try, if they can make a trade happen if they can find a team that will take PJ and Bones Highland, because I don't know how you just trade PJ, honestly. I think you're going to have to compile a trade and put together a second round pick and maybe someone like Bones Highland, hopefully not Amir Coffey, who I know everybody loves too. But it's unfortunate because I am the leader of the Skeleton Key Army. I love Bones Highland. He's one of my favorite players. And I really think last year, if they didn't have Russell Westbrook, but the timeline's just off because I wanted them to have James Harden. I wasn't the biggest Russ fan, because only because at this stage of his career, he's not the same player. He's blowing layups and stuff. If Bones could have really gotten that backup job, like he thought he had won heading into last season, you look at the first four or five games last year, he was getting 15 points per game. He was playing really well. He was thriving. He gets that job taken away from him, and then the sparse minutes he got in garbage time, he didn't take advantage of. That's definitely on him. There was a lot of unserious basketball played by him. Once they brought in James Harden, which bumped down Russell Westbrook to coming off the bench instead of Bones. But then he gets in that game in Chicago, acquits himself well, looks great. End of the year, who was it? Against Phoenix, where he had 37, almost 40 points. 
in a game where the Clippers weren't playing many guys, but still Bones is a, I think a legit backup in this league today. He can play 20 minutes a night. I don't know if it's on a championship team, but he can play in the NBA as a backup point guard. And he has a real skill set. Like he puts him up from three. As much as we criticize some guys on the Clippers for not taking enough three pointers, Bones Highland, I think, just took 12 threes in Seattle against Portland on Friday night. Now, I think he only made three of them, <laughs> but he is not afraid. When you give him the green light, he will try to take advantage of it. I love that part of his game. I just think he needs the right situation, and it doesn't look like it's going to be the Clippers when it comes to him getting minutes and being able to show what he can do in this league. Yeah, you think maybe he has to go to a weaker team because the Denver Nuggets and the Clippers have been win-now teams with championship aspirations. And I was just looking around right now. The Toronto Raptors' backup point guard is Davion Mitchell, who's literally like the exact opposite of Bones, all defense, no offense. I mean – Teams like the Brooklyn Nets, like, could they use Bones Highland? I mean, they have Cam, the Brooklyn Nets have Cam Thomas, but I'm just thinking out loud, like, where he could go. I'm just nervous for the guy because I think, as, I, as I've said before, he's super talented. I do agree with you that he is a backup in this league. I don't know if it's for a good team, though, at least not yet. I got to see that. But he definitely deserves a shot to be just a classic, come off the bench, go get buckets, create some offense on a team in the league. And I don't want him to just like fall out of the league without that chance. Cause he, he's, he's really a guy that when he gets going, it's the type of thing that can completely uplift an entire arena. He's just got that fun energy to his game and that emotion when he's playing well, that seems to lift other people's spirits up. He's electric. He is. He has some of that Kai in him that everybody's loving to see right now. Not with the dunks, but with the three pointers he'll take, you know, early in the shot clock, if he's feeling it, uh, it is somebody that, you're right, wrong place, wrong time, maybe with the two teams he has been on so far. It's just been difficult situations for him to break through, and I don't want to see him out of the league either and not see him get that fair shake because people have been talking about Bones Highland in the preseason and what he is playing for. And if they do move him, our team's going to be interested based upon his preseason play, which has been lacking so far. To me, I look at it like this. The guy has had 37 in a regular season game. The guy has shown stuff in the regular season, and not just that, in two playoff games, one for Denver and one for the Clippers they should have won, game three against Phoenix in 2023, he's balled out in playoff games. Like, I'm not saying he's a made man, but he's proven more than I think people realize in this league so far. You just got to find the right fit for him. Yeah, I tend to agree. Last question before we close the show. You mentioned Kai Jones. He's really proving some of these people in the comment section of our videos kind of right. <laughs> is a two-way contract? It seems like he sealed that if, if that's what he's going to get. But is, is that good enough? Do we want him on a standard deal? And how can we make that happen? It probably involves trading PJ and Bones, right? Yeah, I think they'd have to ship two guys out for one. That opens up a standard contract deal. I'm hesitant in some ways still. I'm not trying to be stubborn about it because I love Kai Jones. I love the energy and the spirit he plays with. And we're when you're talking about a youth movement with a team and a team that's been trying to get younger and more athletic, he checks all of those boxes. He also, it's unusual how polite and how professional he is with the media. If you watch some of these interviews, everything's like, yes, sir, no, sir. I don't know if he has a military background in his family or anything like that, but I just love the guy. He's easy to root for. I do want to say this, though. I want to caution people in this way. Outside of the Dallas game where he did get some minutes against Daniel Gafford, he's really played against nobody at the center position so far in the preseason. He hasn't been tested at all. I think he's paid about, played 600 minutes so far in the NBA total with Charlotte. And he's averaged a two and two and he was on a bad team and he still wasn't getting minutes. And that's part of what happened with the social media thing and him having some mental health issues and all that. But, you know, I'm rooting for him hard. I want him to succeed. I just don't know what he can do against real competition yet, but I'll say this. I haven't seen many guys progress as fast as he has Darian from game one in Honolulu from him looking like a baby deer to a damn buck. <laughs> the last couple of games dunking on everyone. I think he's had like 12 dunks total or something like that. The last couple of games. I say this about Kai Jones. Progress isn't linear. 
except with Kai Jones. <laughs> He's the one guy that seems to be progressing incrementally every game. He gets a little bit better. So the sky is the limit, and I like calling him Sky Jones. And I hope that he does. He's going to get the two-way. I mean, he has to. It's a position of need. Williams has been awesome for them. I don't want to take anything away from him, but Kai Jones, they need him. They don't have a backup right now with Mo Bamba out. But if he does get to play in the first couple of weeks, if Mo Bamba's still out, and he's still playing around this level in 10 or 12 minutes or 15 minutes a night, like he may take the job from Mo Bamba. He really might. I do also want to push back on the competition thing and say this he's mostly going to be playing against backup centers i would think and we know we've talked about this a lot primary source of offenses for teams these days oftentimes not the center especially off the bench so to me his role is going to be can he play good defense and drop coverage and you know alter some shots defensively and then offensively set some screens, catch some lobs, and get some offensive rebounds. I think he can do that against backup competition. And, like, for example, first game, Mason Plumley. Do you think he can outplay Mason Plumley on opening night? Because I sure think he can. Yeah, from what but, we saw last season with Big Plum, he just doesn't look the same. I, and I love this. The Suns fan. This is not any disrespect to Mason Plumley at all because he he's had a really solid career. And at one point, he was a solid center in this league. Even when he – that first season with the Clippers, I had no issues with them at all, 2023. He but, beat the Clippers in 2016 in the playoffs. He was awesome in that series for the Blazers. He was. I was I was trying not to go there, but he was. My bad. It's all good. Um, my my final take on that was that the Suns fans are acting like that's some some big addition for them. And I don't think he's gonna be that much better than Drew Eubanks, but we'll have to let them find out. That'll be an interesting opening game, of course. But Adam, I know you'll be there. We're gonna do some content now on the Clippers talk side of things, let them know where they can find you. Besides that and all the social media handles, all that. Uh, yeah, at follow Adam A on Twitter, on X, and the YouTube channel I started about two months ago. Now for the Clippers Talk podcast, it's in visual form. And I'm just doing way more shows now than I've ever done during the off season, especially at Clippers Talk on YouTube. It's where you can find everything. I think I have over like 150 uploads already in two months. Now, a lot of them are shorts too, so that doesn't really count. Not the same thing, but... I'm trying to catch up. I'm trying to be like Daria in here. I'm trying to give you guys content every single day at Clippers Talk during the season. That is amazing. And, of course, you can follow us or follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dime Dropper Pod. Subscribe to my own YouTube channel, Dime Dropper, for even more Clipper and NBA content. As I said, please check out that video, The Intuit Dome. I tried to cover every single point, and so many fans gave me great stuff. And, of course, for all your Clipper needs throughout the season, five days a week, Locked On Clippers, free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. Let us know what you thought of the discussion and, of course, the starting five that we're going to have on opening night. Now over to Clippers talk. The age-old proverb continues. Go Clippers.